saya ngirim nah, ke oh. dokter ibu ke peserta dulu nanti di mop gitu ke sini ya. nanti berarti nanti ya, ya, langsung ya. mulai aja uh-huh. nih ya uh-huh. ya nanti ya, itu masuk dulu gitu siap siap oke okay. ya aku udah kirim juga sih saya udah standby untuk ini ya kamera anda ya udah dibuka ya peserta ya oke okay. Baik, saya buka ya Bapak dan Ibu. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning and welcome to the International Guest Lecture, Major Hazard and Risk Management. Today's event, Thursday 25th of March 2021, is organized by Occupational Health and Safety Master's Program, Faculty of Public Health Universitas Indonesia, and also supported by Universitas Indonesia Alumni Association and the UHS Student Association of Faculty of Public Health Universitas Indonesia. First, I would like to welcome to Dr. Tony Green, the Director of ArtSAP Pacific. And then I would like to welcome Professor Sabarina Prasetyo as the Dean of Faculty of Public right. Health. And also Ibu Indri Hapsari Sutsilawati, PhD, as the Head of OHS Department. And also I would like to welcome Bapak Dr. Zulkifli Junaidi as the Head of OHS Master Program. And also Professor Fatma Lestari as the Moderator. And I would like to welcome the lecturer from the UHS department. And also I would like to welcome all participants, our OHS fellow students, alumni, as well as, well as practitioners from various industries who have attended this event. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Miranda Suryawardani, and I will get through this event as the master of ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to explain the schedule for today's event. The event of this of today event uh, will be opened by the Dean of Faculty of Public Health and also the Head of OHS Master Program. And then we start the presentation from the speaker, then followed by a Q&A discussion session. And ladies and gentlemen, I will expect you to pay attention to these following matters. First, please turn off your microphone as well as your video. You are not allowed to screen share during this event. If you have any question, please write it down through the Q&A section with the format your name and then your question. It is expected that all participants to fill the attendance list on the link that we will be sent via the chat column. Ladies and gentlemen, in accordance to the OHS requirement in Universitas Indonesia, first I will deliver the safety induction. As today's event is conducted online using the Zoom platform, we would like to ask our participant to pay attention to the visibility of your PC, laptop, or your mobile device that you use. Secondly, please make sure your sitting position are safe during the session. And also, please pay attention to your the electric, electrical hazard as well as such as Uh, charger cable or switch around you. If you attend this seminar together, please do physical distancing all the time. And please stay healthy during the COVID-19 pandemic and also practice 5M, wearing your mask, hand washing, physical distancing, avoiding crowd, and limit your mobilization. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, let us say a prayer to God Almighty. Please start praying. Yeah, pray over. Next, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Bapak Dr. Zulkifli Junaidi 
as the head of WHS Master Program to deliver a speech. Please, Pak Zul, time is yours. Hello. Yeah, please, Pak Zul. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Miranda, for the time. Um, I would like to say thank you to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning for all participants and also uh, for all speakers in this international guest lecture. First of all, I would like to say thank you very much for Dr. Tony Green. He was my lecture uh, um, more than 20 years ago in the uh, Department of Safety Science in University of New South Wales when I was when I did my uh, master degree. And uh, also, uh, I would like to say thank you to for uh, uh, all the lecturer, all academic staff in the uh, Department of Occupational Health and Safety, uh, Faculty of Public Health University of Indonesia, and also for the Dean of uh, Faculty of Public Health, Professor Sandarina. Uh, I would like to inform this, this international guest lecture is one of our program uh, in, uh, to, to achieve the, the international accreditation and also uh, international benchmarking and also uh, visiting a professorship. Uh, yeah, uh, last year we have a, a grant from uh, University of Indonesia to develop uh, all the programs, something like uh, international benchmarking. And at the moment we have uh, a collaboration with the University of Queensland and also uh, other university to uh, yeah, related to uh, to our program in uh, achieve the uh, international accreditation. So for all the participants, uh, thank you for the participants. Uh, at the moment we have uh, more than uh, seven hundred, almost uh, eight hundred, maybe you know, maybe uh, will be uh, more than one thousand because the participants uh, in uh, our registration, about uh, 2,000 participants. And we hope uh, today we, uh, we can uh, improve our knowledge in a major hazard and mismanagement from uh, Dr. Tom Green. Uh, and uh, we hope this is uh, very uh, useful and beneficial for our student and for our me and also for our partner in uh, in this industrial uh, in Indonesia. That's all my uh, opening speech, and I thank you very much for all the stakeholders uh, who support uh, this international case lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Pak Zul. And next is the opening speech uh, from the Dean of Faculty of Public Health, Professor Sabarina Prasutyo. So I would like to invite Professor Sabarina. Thank you very much. Uh, very good morning, uh, Dr. Tony Green uh, from Australia. Uh, it must be, uh, it has already been afternoon. <laughs> so thank you for joining us and also uh, your uh, kindness to give and share about the major hazard and risk management. Uh, I think uh, thank you for uh, this being a guest lecture in our uh, study program uh, in occupational health and safety. I think uh, first of all, we uh, thank God Almighty uh, that allowing us to gather here. Uh, this morning and have uh, Dr. Tony Green and other colleagues here to discuss about the, in the important issue in occupational health and safety. And I think this lecture will be useful for the students as well as the practitioners. Uh, and also we can uh, share uh, what is the field experiences and also to uh, see what is the uh, the better uh, knowledge that we will uh, take into our consideration. 
So uh, I also thank to Professor uh, Fatma Lestari and Dr. Zulkifli Zunaidi. Dr. Zulkifli Zunaidi, thank you very much for bringing this uh, guest lecture for the students. And also to the head of the department and Professor Meili and other colleagues from the Department of Occupational Health and Safety. And uh, thank you for the students as well as the participants uh, that uh, your availability in joining this lecture is very um, important. And we are very appreciating this uh, kind of a lecture. So uh, without further ado, I think uh, I will open uh, this uh, guest lecture uh, officially and hope that uh, the discussion will be fruitful and uh, everybody will take the lessons learned and Dr. Tony Green will share uh, his high ex uh, experiences uh, because the Dr. Tony Green is a very uh, prominent researcher, I think, and also the the advisors of uh, our colleagues here, Professor Fatma, Dr. Zulkifli, and also Dr. Chandra. So again, thank you very much and enjoy the discussion. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Thank you, Professor Sabarina. And then I would like to ask Professor Sabarina to deliver the certificate of appreciation to our speaker, Dr. Tony Green. Uh, please, Dr. Professor Sabarina. Dr. Tony Green, this is the certificate of uh, appreciation from the Faculty of Public Health. Uh, thank you for your kindness to uh, share uh, your uh, experience in, uh, especially in this uh, major hazard in risk management. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I hope I'm worthy of uh, this appreciation. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Sabarina. And then before we start, I would like to invite all panelists to take picture together. So please uh, activate your video and uh, I would like to ask help from the host to take the picture. Okay, I will count for the take picture. One, two, three. Okay, I think enough. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. Now we're going to start the presentation with the speaker, but it will be guided by the moderator, Professor Fatma Lestari. Before I invite Professor Fatma, I would like to introduce our beloved moderator. Professor Fatma is a professor of OHS Department in Faculty of Public Health Universitas Indonesia, and she is also the head of the Disaster Risk Reduction Center, Universitas Indonesia. She achieved her bachelor and master's degree in chemical and her PhD in safety science from University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia. And Professor Fatma also participated in many organizations such as UN Disaster Risk Reduction Working Group on ATTAC and then Indonesian Safety Council and also a member of US National Fire Protection Association. So please welcome Professor Fatma Lestari. Thank you very much, uh, Miranda. Uh, let me uh, allow me to introduce uh, Dr. Tony Green. Uh, he was my uh, former supervisor during my uh, study in University of New South Wales, and also our uh, lecture uh, for, from for our several our colleagues in occupational health and safety department. So uh, he is now uh, as an independent researcher, director of ArtsCap Pacific, and also a principal visiting fellow from School of Computing and Information Technology. Uh, previously, uh, he was the lecturer in University of New South Wales from School of Safety Science. And uh, he was a member, he is a member also International Association for Fire Safety Science and other uh, standards of Australia. 
So I welcome Dr. Tony Green uh, to deliver his uh, presentation, which are very interesting today. And please uh, have uh, your time. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, introduction, um, Professor uh, Yo. I hope I've got that right. Um, and of course, Professor Zukifli and uh, Fatma uh, Lestari um, for your introduction. Uh, today, I want to um, talk about major hazards, uh, risks, and their amelioration. As Professor uh, Zakithli will know, uh, the major hazards course that I gave must have been over a decade ago, uh, was uh, a 10-week course. And there is, I can't get all that information into uh, a single lecture. But what I thought I would do is just have a look at some of the risks. And I hope that works, yes. Um, and how people tend to think about risks, uh, because if you don't get that right, you will never actually stop having major hazard accidents. Uh, so if we can start, I hope this works, yes. As you can see from that, probably most of you will remember last year, there was a huge explosion in Beirut involving a uh, ammonia store, uh, ammonium nitrate store. And that caused the devastation that you see uh, basically in terms of radii from the center of the explosion. Uh, it seems to have been started by a fire that then uh, escalated to include the store. But the reason why ammonium nitrate hadn't been moved from the store was more political than it was to do with uh, necessarily uh, the operation of the actual store. The second one I'm going to show is the eyes of the world today stunned by this image. This was debris from a meteor racing toward Earth, streaking across the sky there, crashing into the ground in those woods. And look at some of the other images emerging tonight. The cloudy trail the meteor produced, and on impact, this, carving a little pool into a frozen lake. It's the biggest meteor in more than a century to hit the... I'm not going to show that for 30 minutes, um, but that was the... Um, bolide that came across Sibilinsk in Siberia in uh, Russia uh, a decade ago. Um, in fact, uh, just over uh, the 10th anniversary of that incident. The senator that's responsible for that area in Russia was telling me that uh, over 1,500 people were injured uh, from that, mainly from uh, flying glass due to the shockwave that occurred. So I want you to start thinking about, are these both major hazard risks? Uh, and what distinguishes the two? Uh, and what are their similarities? And can they both be controlled? Uh, it's a difficult one to answer because depending on your perspective, you'll have different views on all these, but these two are examples of major hazard risks. So I want to actually talk about how you distinguish the two. Well, one's obviously a natural phenomena, 
nominally there's no control, but that's with modern technology not necessarily true. If you can uh, see where it is coming from early enough, because you've got time to intercept. Uh, and there are international collaborations going on at the moment to look at these near-Earth or object um, disasters on a worldwide basis and understand them better. And we don't understand them properly uh, so that we can actually control them. On the other hand, the Beirut one, we understand that a lot better and it could have been controlled. Planet. This one crashed Oops. in Russia. No. A thousand it. people were injured from shards of flying glass. And That's it. <laughs> so, what are major hazards? Uh, they're basically hazards that, if they occur, will cause death and injury both within an organization and outside the organization. Uh, you often find that there's collapse and damage to property outside an organization. And in the extreme events, collapse of societies and support structures uh, occur. So that the it takes a while for the society to get back uh, to where they were before the accident occurred. Uh, one of the reasons I'm showing the icon of satellite view of northern Sumatra after the tsunami in 2004 is that the total society structures were actually wiped out in that event. Um, but the problem really arises, uh, comes about in major hazards because you're dealing with low probability of occurrence with high impact. And of course, uh, unless you understand how you can get that actually occurring, you tend to put it to one side because there are other objectives that in an organization which you're much more comfortable with dealing with. So some of the problems are maintaining a state of safety uh, so that the systems that you have fail safely and don't actually fail to causing problems outside your organization. Um, you often find that inadequacy of controls is one of the reasons, even if they're maintained, why you get failure. And organizations as a whole tend to focus on officially, uh, although when you dig a bit deeper, you usually find that that's only in terms of uh, monetary rather than safe operational uh, conditions at all times. And you have other instances that really come around from this drive to efficiency, the downsizing of personnel. But if you downsize too much, you don't have the people that can spot the uh, problems arising, and you lose the technical knowledge uh, of how to deal with uh, things on site. Um, <clears throat> technology change can introduce new hazards into the systems that you haven't really thought about. And you really need to consider that in the planning stages uh, of any operation. And focus on immediate timescales uh, rather than including what can happen in the long term and how uh, many of your controls might degrade over time. And of course, the other one is you ignore human behavior in both often the risk assessment in the first place and also how human behavior can actually undermine, maintain, maintaining safe environments. So one can consider risks in terms of tame risks. These tend to be dealt with independently. So they you concentrate on one system only and uh, analyze it as an independent system from other uh, systems. And there is no risk feedback uh, from other systems into the problem you're trying to assess. The benefit is usually it's quite quick to do, uh, and it allows a description of risk 
in terms of likelihood and consequence on a continuous spectrum so that you can make judgments about where you want and what type of con controls you can have. The other type of risk, really, systems is um, or are wicked risks. They occur in complex and complicated risks. And most organizations that have major hazards problems are actually quite complex in the way they operate. So there are substantial feedback mechanisms that lead to long tail risks if the system is analyzed as a tame risk. And that usually comes at out as a low probability, high impact event. Um, but you find that in these systems, high impact risk can occur when certain conditions actually line up. And it's why there, back in the uh, 90s, uh, 1990s that is, uh, there was a move towards defense in depth in terms of your control systems. Since then, there's also been development in international risk standards uh, for this area. Um, ISO 31000, uh, the risk management standard, provides guidance and principles on how to manage risks in organizations. And the uh, sub-standard 3000 110 uh, actually discusses risk assessment techniques. Now, there's some 30 odd techniques that are identified as being useful in this area. But the risk management standard itself doesn't say that you have to use one technique or another. It's what is most appropriate for the systems you're analyzing. But one of the problems is that you tend to end up analyzing risks in terms of tame risks rather than wicked risks. And of course, one area that has its own standard is managing legal risks. And that's because companies, large scale companies, are actually concerned about reputation and public liability. But there are other standards that hang off this, like the, um, I think it's 2000. Uh, 28,000 uh, standard, which is for uh, chain linkages in uh, for delivery of food uh, and other articles in society. They all rely on this risk management standard. So let's have a brief look at what this standard actually is asking us to do. So first of all, the definition of risk is a bit different from what most people in the safety area think is risk. It's the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Uh, the effect is a deviation from what you expect. And, in, and it can be both positive and negative. The fact that it's a deviation from an expected value suggests that you're, you have enough data to actually make a statistical determination of what the problem is. And with major hazards, you often find that type of uh, information, particularly on causal factors, is missing. Uh, objectives can have different aspects, such as financial, health, environmental, uh, strategic, organizational, wide, or project levels. And you can apply the same sorts of processes to anything that you do. Uh, but you do need to recognize that different domains tend to look at risks differently and uh, have different outcomes. And some of these are useful and some of them are not. Um, Risks are often uh, characterized by uh, potential events and consequences, i.e. you're guessing effectively what can happen by combination of, of different types of factors. And 
you often find that they are then defined in terms of consequences and the likelihood of occurrence. And as I was saying earlier, that's due to treating them as tame risks. And there's uncertainty in the actual state, even partial deficiency of information related to understanding or knowledge of an event, its consequence or likelihood. So again, on major hazards, you are actually find that there's insufficient data on how factors come together to actually cause a uh, coupling between different parts of the organization. Um, there's often insufficient data on what the actual scale of impact is going to be. You know it might go across your boundary, but then it sometimes gets a bit difficult without a good modeling to determine what or who is going to be affected and what the uncertainties are in that sort of estimation. And there's often insufficient data on escalation paths, pathways of that impact. And I'll give a few examples in later on. Um, and of course, in any modeling, uh, there are always assumptions that are made about the modeling. And, the, and sometimes you have to dig quite deeply to understand whether the modeling is really appropriate for what you're trying to model. Even though it might can't come up with an answer, it might not be appropriate. And are the controls adequate for the magnitude of impact that you expect? It might stop it path part of the way, but if the controls um, get overwhelmed, you end up with the full impact of the event. And of course, the impact of behavior on causes and how that actually causes the escalation paths is not well understood at all. So you've got a number of caveats when you start dealing with quite complex systems. Now, there's a class of uh, risk events that uh, are commonly called black swan events. They've arisen because in Europe, anyway, no one had seen a black swan until they came to Australia. Um, so they're supposedly events that are unforeseen and have unforeseen consequences and not within experience. And the logical deduction from that is that it won't happen, cannot be foreseen and therefore cannot be controlled. But really what you find uh, is something entirely different. Uh, uncertainty in complex and complicated systems uh, means that rarity of events leads to little analysis. It's the inverse Pareto law. Now, the Pareto law tells you, is often used in management, that if you can get something 80% right, uh, it will work okay and you'll have time to fix things up. You can't do that with major hazards because something will go wrong and it will escalate. So you actually have to look at what are your top events and come back from that on how you actually control them. You find that uh, there's a lot of rationalization goes on after the event. Uh, and politically, uh, typically politically. Um, and historically, they're often considered as, as outliers. And that comes back to being solely reliant on statistics driving uh, how you operate. But the reality is, the factors are not static, they're dynamic, so they keep on changing. Dynamic behaviors are poorly understood because they themselves are complex mathematically. Uh, and they're often ignored because there is no immediate impact. So the assessment ends up focusing on static assumptions, uh, which are themselves inadequate. And then you have the difficulty of funding either internally within an organization or 
uh, from the public purse to actually fund adequate control. So you can get a situation where uh, basically the, the management processes pushes it out of sight so it becomes out of mind and you actually are doomed to failure under those circumstances. Now, as an example of a black swan event, Hurricane Katrina um, was considered unpredictable in strength, landfall, uh, position, surge, uh, sorry, um, storm surge height and rainfall. But by the time that happened, there had been a lot of technical developments that had produced five categories of increasing strength where there were good estimates of wind strength, good estimates of storm surges, good estimates of height uh, uh, and rain, sorry, storm surge height and rainfall. And better satellite tracking allowed you to model uh, reasonably well the estimates for landfall position. What you had was the levee construction was actually equivalent to a Hurricane 3 uh, control. So it would never stop a Category 5 uh, hurricane actually making, it la making landfall there and uh, swamping New Orleans. The levee was 1950s construction. It was known to be vulnerable in the 1990s, but there was really no uh, real review of how to actually deliver a safe uh, levy for the population. And it was politically expedient to focus on other issues rather than spend the money on raising the levy. The Tohoku tsunami in Japan in 2011 is another example. So there are hundreds of stones like the one shown in the diagram, which was above Fukushima uh, in Japan. The inscription, which uh, Mark Willisey uh, translated for me, was the homes on higher places will guarantee the comforts of descendants remind the horror of the tsunami, do not build homes below this point. You'll notice that uh, this is an intergenerational warning uh, to future generations uh, about the dangers of building below that stone level. When the earthquake occurred, 25% of the homes built below that level disappeared in the uh, tsunami and as we know many lives were lost in that. You find that you often only takes three generations to repeat history although history doesn't exactly repeat. Those who experience it don't tend to repeat it because they really know how it's going to affect you and society. They teach it to their offspring that provide adequate warning to be cautious. But their offspring don't necessarily get the same message uh, and therefore ignore history. But you find in indigenous cultures like we have in Australia that are 50, 60,000 years old, that the oral tradition because there are many who learn these stories across three generations all sitting around a campfire, make sure that the uh, third generation actually know exactly what the story was and are, are chastised for not getting it correct. So history also provides us with a way that you can sometimes deal with trying to stop uh, things from repeating. But coming back to your own organizations, how do your managers behave? Do they 
ignore warning signs when they are put to them? Uh, do they have KPIs that are properly aligned to looking at the major hazards risk you might have within the company? And is it consistent with your risk history, what you're doing? The millennium bug, is it fact or fiction? Many uh, younger generation people think it's fiction. But the problem was first identified in the ninth, late 1970s. Uh, it gained traction amongst multinational energy companies and banks in the 1990s and governments as well. Uh, and the concern was over embedded process logic uh, controllers. Uh, these were on individual bits of equipment. They weren't li linked to the, to the internet, uh, but they had limited word length for their processes. So you had came and found that you had different results depending on the word length in your processor between with addition and subtraction. There was something like uh, 28, 30 dates that then had different problems. Some of them are, sh are shown there. The last one is in 2038. So we're still working through this. But by 1998, there were software solutions for networks and connected applications. But there were still no real solutions for isolated uh, PLCs. In 1999, the FTSE 500 companies uh, did tests on their organization and 33% of them reported problems. And 90% of those problems were believed to have caused serious disruption had they not actually done something about it. In the event of 2000, sorry, um, there were something like 4,000 events worldwide. Nothing really significant. The most serious was actually on a nuclear power plant in Japan. But it's thought that there was quite a lot of under-reporting, and the reason for that is companies didn't want reputation loss. So... And another example, this last year, we've had the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's thought to originate in bats in China. And the first identified case was in Wuhan in December 2019. One of the problems is in a pandemic, the population doesn't have any immunity. So there is an urgent need to develop vaccines that control and immunize people against it. Uh, in January 2019, sorry, 2020, uh, scientists in China actually gave the genetic code for the virus to work in the West and in other countries. And it allowed unprecedented financial investment and scientific collaboration worldwide to develop new vaccines. Currently, there are seven vaccines that have been rolled out worldwide uh, with over 200 vaccine candidates under development, including ones that they hope will uh, prevent some of the problems that are starting to emerge from mutation changes uh, with the virus. Now, some of these mutations have occurred. There are 17 or more changes to the spike, spike protein. The one from Southeast England uh, is one of them. The one in South Africa, another in Brazil. They've got these enormous amount of changes compared with the Wuhan virus. And some of these have been associated with increase in transmission rates. It's not clear at the moment whether you've also got increased severity. But don't be surprised if you do. Current vaccines seem to be slightly less effective against highly mutated strains, but if you can actually get the population um, 
vaccine with uh, a large enough, the actual cases and spread of the disease decreases quite dramatically. And hence the mutation rate in the virus also decreases. So all of these are examples of major hazards. Uh, and there are lessons that one can learn from this. Hurricane Katrina, for example, the knowledge changes over time. So you have to have some means of picking up the knowledge base is changing worldwide. Uh, and can allow for alternative decisions. Uh, human decision is often based on expediency, but expediency does not control a major hazard. And a failure to adapt systems to new knowledge can be very costly. The tsunami is an example where history is gradually lost unless it's compensated for. The maximum event must be considered at all times. Uh, and talking about that tsunami, the actual Fukushima nuclear power plant had a defense against tsunami. It needed to have been 15 meters high to have actually prevented uh, a washout of the reactor in the event. The Y2K problem, early identification of the problem, and then a critical mass to actually do something about it. And action prior to the event always limits the loss. And again, you see that in the uh, pandemic, early identification of the genetic structure um, both reduces time for vaccine development, but it also allows for testing and tracing to actually keep the numbers down that stop uh, hospitals being overwhelmed with very sick patients who are going to, to die. So when it comes to your critical systems for major hazards, have you analysed your system without any control, what would happen? Because that gives us an indication of what your top event is likely to be. What changes in systems will lead to disaster? Because that gives you an idea of the access paths to disaster. And do your critical controls that you have identified actually produce the result you want? Or can they be used to ensure that you fail to safety if they fail? Uh, and how can you ensure that critical controls are maintained? And again, that relates to how um, information loss occurs within an organization because of the movement of people between jobs or from jobs or just retirement and things like that. And how do you capture and retain the critical decisions uh, in your organization that start, made sure that you had enough controls in the first place? Because new board members, new managers were probably totally unaware of why these decisions were made and why you need to maintain them. So there are challenges for risk quantification because a lot of the work when it comes to actually looking at physical uh, effects requires modeling and quantification from that. So you often find that there's coupling, um, increased coupling in systems and geographical sense. Everyone's familiar with vehicle accidents, common medical conditions, workers' compensation uh, and insurance that deals with those types of things. And of course, there is a lot of actuarial consequence assessment to set insurance premiums. And there is a lot of data about that that one can use to actually reduce the incidence. And that will be the subject of a lot of your other courses, I suspect. 
But as you get to other systems, the coupling increases. So, for example, chemical plant is a single plant, but oil production is an extended field geographically. Uh, power generation uh, is probably in the wrong place. It, it generates singly, but it has um, extents in terms of couplings to grids for um, distribution of electricity. Tsunamis are events that are effectively localised, but they can still have effects uh, half a world away. And then there are food chains. While you might have local surprise to supplies, um, interruption to those food chains can cause um, famine quite quickly if you can't maintain your food chains. And, of course, these can be worldwide, these food chains, and the same with supply chains. So you've got individual events can be poorly quantified and it's best to start using aggregate events from around the world to inform on how your systems might react. And motivation uh, in terms of human behavior is poorly measured. So uh, some of the things that don't get done are actually to, to do with how people are motivated in particular jobs. And again, You've got uh, interdependency between the connectivity and geographical uh, extent. Pandemics, aircraft flying from one part of the world to the other have introduced the pandemic from one country to another more rapidly than historically would have occurred. Um, the internet uh, gives you an interdependency in society. If you lost it, how would people communicate? Are they still able to communicate so that your social fabric doesn't actually uh, fall apart? Uh, terrorism, it's often organised uh, from across the world, even though the events might actually be carried out locally. Uh, global warming is a long-term coupling of different climate parts of the climate system. And it is, you know, worldwide. And cyber attacks, again, can be started in uh, a country that you've never heard of and yet develop into a major attack around theft of information and that type of thing that can affect your operations. So there are challenges on how you can analyse highly complex uh, systems. And it requires more complex methods and broader thinking. People often think about Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is the one people should go for. But people forget that there is a caveat to that. That while that is true, it's only true if what you're looking at is as complicated as the system that you're analyzing. So you can easily get to the situation where you think it's a very easy solution, but because you haven't taken complexity into account, um, it's going to fail. Perception is another thing that's poorly understood. Because you're dealing with risk and risk scenarios, uh, you've got to have the scenarios. And that depends on your history of the individual and the history of organizations of how different people perceive things to, can occur. And that can cause problems in discussion about what risks are actually important. Um, so there is a need to develop uh, methods for perceived risks that parallel objective methods uh, of physical hazards, for instance. And then there is value correspondence. How do you trade off between security and freedom, for example, or between uh, supplying 
certain um, things for society against the other risks you might have in the organization. And again, new methods and metrics that cope with diverse values in social groups uh, become important. And we've seen this in the last four years in the US where uh, political popularism has been driving a lot of uh, the politics that's going on, but that's not necessarily good for the actual country as a whole. And even if you could quantify the risks, you've still got challenges in risk qualification of identifying what the risks are and how you can control them. Because you've got many domains of influence that are actually impacting on an organization. You've got politics and regulation, economics and finance, systems designs, operation and emergency procedures, just to name four. There are others. And each of those has a number of factors that can interfere with each other. And then over that, you can overlay the hazards and threats that can, in each area, that can actually lead to quite serious problems. For example, uh, corruption. Bhopal in India, um, site for the uh, Union Carbide plant before it uh, sort of exploded. So, was actually due to corruption in terms of land use with local politicians. Um, and that start, started the uh, ball rain, um, sort of rolling of, of why it was an inappropriate location. The standards were different from a similar plant that was operated in the US, for example. So you've got those types of impacts that actually do make a difference to um, your risk, particularly where you're involved with international organizations or international companies. So how do you actually start analyzing this? Well, logic trees and logical processes are a good start. For example, in the gas industry, you can, uh, let's see if we can get that going while I keep talking. Rupture of the pipeline, high pressure pipeline, uh, ruptures, it doesn't look big, but uh, it can cause an enormous problem. And of course the rupture can give you a release of gas that doesn't necessarily ignite immediately. It can do, but it doesn't necessarily do that. You can have delayed ignition. You can also have confinement and semi-confinement. And consequently, you have a range of different outcomes. But by using logic trees, you can actually sort out what the difference and then uh, see how well they're controlled. Another one on uh, in the petrochemical industry are tank fires. You've got cause of a critical event that can lead to a rim seal fire or a full surface fire. And uh, let's see that. This is a test of uh, a system to how to deal with a rim seal fire. But if you've got lack of drainage on the tank roof, that causes collapse, you end up with a full surface fire, and that's an escalation. If there's too much water, it causes overfill of the tank, and you end up with a bun fire. Too much water can also accumulate in the bottom of the tank, and you end up with boiler. And lack of cooling water, water means radiation can cause failure on the second tank and rupture of it and bund overflow and fire spread. So you have uh, to think about uh, how these processes actually occur and can be controlled. 
Another example is uh, a, an attack on a company or a political target or infrastructure. Um, you have to think about how visible is the target you're considering. Uh, what's it layout? Is it critical to other systems? Do you have enough surveillance of it so that you can actually get pre-warning as opposed to post-warning um, or post-analysis uh, that allows you to capture people? And what are alternative targets? Because you'll often find that there are different targets that are in society that uh, you can try and push them elsewhere if you're in an organisation. Uh, and what sort of weapon systems do people have access to? So weapon systems in this case is also about uh, internet. Um, hacking, internet, uh, malfeasance uh, in, and in, uh, data. With physical spaces, how is your space are actually used? Is it clustering, uh, the design, and are there interconnections? If you think about high-rise buildings, you often find there are two alternative uh, escape routes, but the problem is they're often built around the central uh, process, so that if one gets blocked, you can usually find the other gets blocked as well. Whereas if you had totally independent means of egress, you could get everyone out of the building. Um, logistics, how do people have access and how would you actually deploy a specific type of weapon, whether it's on your computer system or whether it's physical? And what routes do they need to overcome? One of the uh, problems with MH370 and the loss of that aircraft is that uh, there was a suspicion about whether the uh, satellite communications had been interfered with. And both Boeing and Airbus went in effectively into lockdown to actually examine that in great detail. So okay, you've got... Funny. Yeah, yeah, coming up yeah, to the yeah. end. Oh, right. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's all right. <laughs> now you can see that one's prevention, the other is the uh, sort of response. Again, you've got to ask yourself questions about that. And effectively, what you're doing is trying to map out uh, in some way how the hazards combine with threats to produce a top event. Uh, and how they can be controlled. And you've got to take into account escalation controls uh, on how you actually do it. Uh, I'll skip. I was going to talk a bit about behaviour and other things, but I will skip that. You can see from what I've been saying that there's actually a framework for risk evaluation, but unfortunately it involves a lot of different domains. Uh, and that is because these are not simple risks. They might look like it on the ground, but in fact, there's a lot of dy dynamics associated with it. So you, you have a means by which you have to measure your system performance all the time in the various domains to actually provide feedback on whether they're failing or not. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much for that. I'm sorry I didn't quite get through it, but uh, <laughs> any questions and discussion? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your comprehensive uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Sonny Green. Uh, I would like to invite uh, our colleagues uh, from Occupational Health and Safety Department to uh, provide the question and answers. So. Please, uh, the panelists, question and answer. Is there any uh, questions for Tony Green from our colleagues? Uh, Dr. Zulkifli, or Mufti, oh yeah, Mas Mufti, silakan. Yeah, 
uh, thank you for uh, the time and uh, thank you for your uh, I don't know comprehensive and I think it's a very good uh, presentation but uh, unfortunately uh, we have a limit time right I, th I think there's uh, some uh, things that uh, can be explored uh, maybe my question is uh, I have an interest when you say that uh, risk evaluation is a big thing a broad thing yeah uh, how do we uh, get uh, maybe uh, a good uh, maybe good perception in in, in I think uh, I mean in one page or in 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 one perception uh, between the you know be, be, between the practitioners in uh, the field and maybe like you say um, uh, the the politic the politician or maybe the uh, government or uh, policy maker yeah sometimes when we uh, evaluate the race uh, it uh, may yeah you know like a contradictory or uh, have a different perspective or different point of view how do we uh, get uh, these uh, things done you know, when we talk about uh, risk especially like uh, like now uh, we talk about coronavirus that uh, yeah you say that uh, sometimes uh, history uh, not helping yeah but uh, we have to uh, get a good analysis maybe that's uh, my question uh, i hope you understand Uh, yes, I, I understand, and yeah. thank thank you very much for that. It's uh, actually quite a difficult one to to answer, because my experience of politicians is that they want simple information. They never read anything, um, and uh, consequently, it's very difficult to get a complex um, information into a simpler simple form. Uh, and you've actually got to get others uh, to uh, help you. The advantage um, in the pandemic, at least in Australia, has been that uh, because the uh, Prime Minister was fairly well on the nose because of the bushfires we'd had uh, sort of over the previous few months, uh, he followed actually followed the scientific advice, the public health advice. Uh, and that relied solely on scientific information. So a starting point for all this is what does the science actually tell you about uh, the hazards and threats and also about the psychology uh, with different types of cultures. Now, politicians Uh, like to think of themselves as a breed apart from everyone else and they have their own culture so you've got to understand that and how it actually uh, works uh, to give them the information that they can make the uh, uh, correct decision and of course death and injury doesn't necessarily um, swap politicians Per se, be in terms. And if you look, the bit that I didn't um, brand talking about was some of the implications of that and how the people's brains actually do do work from a scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. And what we've been doing over the last decade is to try and build. Uh, computer systems that will emulate that type of uh, brain system so that you actually can overlay hazards and risks so people can actually see and visualize what can, can happen. And again, science has come a long way in various fields, particularly with the physical hazards, to actually uh, demonstrate this. But what is often missing is then the behavior of people. Mm. Interesting. Okay. I hope that Thank answers you your question. I'm not sure it does, but uh, <laughs> <Okay>. yeah. <laughs> Thank you yeah, so Pak much. Zul. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Pak Zul. Monggo, silakan. Okay. Thank you, Mubarak. Uh, yeah, I have a two question for uh, for Tony. Uh, 
The first one is about uh, the, the uncertainty factors in uh, this uh, management the concept here, yeah. and and also maybe in major hazard uh, or risk uh, concept about the uncertainty factors uh, related to the variation of uh, resources and also contributing factors in uh, quantifying the risk. Uh, what what do you uh, what do you explain about about these uncertainty factors? Uh, and the second one is about the uh, the new risk come from the uh, risk control activities and the new risk how to uh, prevent and also control this uh, new risk come from the risk control activities that's my question uh, thank you Tony. okay uh, if i understood that the first was uncertainty uh, vari yeah. variation of yeah re reasons for Variation of the uh, uh, oh, resources, factors. yeah, contributing factors to, uh, to and how quantity. does that affect the quantification yeah. of risk? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Well, you need uh, ideally you need to be able to look at how what people do within an organisation and how that couples to the risks and model it. Now. You can do this. There are certain agent-based type models, micro-simulation, which is what I've been doing for the last decade, is one technique, but there are others in trying to look at how um, different decisions are made and how that then impacts on the um, overall outcome. Uh, so you need a combined uh, model that combines both the, the hazard or the major hazard that you're looking at with the behavior. And I don't think, uh, I haven't seen anything in the literature that uh, actually does that yet. But there are groups around the world that are working on this. So I, I hope that answers the first one. The second one was uh, about new risks. Is that right? And introducing new risks. Well, you've got to have a look at uh, part is that is a management of change approach so that you identify uh, what can go wrong in the first place with, with the technology uh, and see how they're controlled and whether their failures actually lead to non-control of your, of your system. Uh, you need to be aware of how dynamic your system is in order to uh, quantify it. And coming back to just one involving any human behavior, you, you often have to repeat uh, the same calculation. Uh, you don't need to repeat it 10,000 times, which is what the statisticians like to do. Uh, but you probably need enough examples so that you've got a good eye feel for both what the mean outcome is and what the spread in the outcome actually is. Does that answer your question? Yeah, Tony, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, Pazu. Is there any uh, other questions from uh, our colleagues from Occupational Health and Safety Department? All right. Okay, uh, I think before I move to uh, open the questions uh, from Q&A uh, questions, so I would like to let you know that this uh, webinar are also uh, open in UI TV, TV, in UI TV. So uh, at the moment we have a live streaming uh, from the support of our uh, Universitas Indonesia Public Relations. Uh, <clears throat> uh, then they open for uh, streaming on uh, UI TV. So and also this uh, webinar are uh, conducted uh, because of the support also from the grant of uh, directorate for academic development and le learning resources uh, that allow us to have these uh, international guest lectures. 
Okay, now I move to the question and answer from the attendees. So the first one is um, from Ulin Niam. Uh, shall we, Tony, uh, do you prefer to, I open the questions and one by one? I, 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 I've got it on my screen. Uh, oh, all right. So okay. you can uh, go through or, or you can uh, also so, request. Well, I can, I can uh -huh. try and go through them. Yeah, yeah. All right. Great. Okay. The Please, first, uh, first one is about uh, basically uh, encroachment of uh, the population around an already built chemical plant. Uh, it's a problem worldwide uh, that, that occurs. And uh, it is a role for government to think very strategically about uh, planning rules and regulations and how you enforce them. Uh, you, you find in a lot of uh, places, uh, shanty towns in particular built up, for example, in Brazil and India, around these types of chemical plants. And of course, if you have a major hazard event, um, then they're the first ones to get injured and killed. Um, so it's important that you actually have uh, good governance of that. But one of the problems you find is that developers want to develop land near these sites and want to do that in spite of there being um, a major hazards plant nearby. Uh, and consequently, um, political corruption does often play a part in overriding these planning laws. So good governance actually requires the government uh, to have an independent process um, so that you don't get interference from politicians in that process. Uh, I'm not sure whether that answers you, but uh, it, it gives you some idea of the complexity that you actually find when you've actually gone and studied a lot of these types of accidents in the past. Uh, so I hope that answers your question, Alin. Yeah. Um, right, Tatted. Uh, is it necessary to create a hazard report for middle industry? Um, it might not be necessarily to do the HAZOP report, but it's a good idea to actually do the methodology and go through the process to find out whether you've got significant risks that are likely to lead to failure. It's a good quantitative uh, technique uh, for doing that. Um, there, and I, you know, it is used really in the petrochemical industry a lot, but uh, it can be useful for uh, middle risk industries uh, where there are, say, distributions uh, of other coming from other types of uh, factories and stuff. Because you find that, um, just trying to think of, of your hazardous zoning, for example, uh, can be thrown up by doing that type of investigation or whether you've got adequate zoning actually within your storages in the way people access uh, things with forklifts and, and things like that. So um, it's you only actually need the report if you actually need to make change, but it's a good idea to have uh, data from it so that you can refer to it back to it. Um, I hope that answers your, your question. Uh, uh, okay, do you need a help? Sorry. Yeah, I'm I'm just reading it. <laughs> All right. Yep. I can help yeah. to read that. Uh, 
No, it's it's. Um, I wouldn't have called it a black uh, swan event because um, the, there are methods. There were methods before 2011 to actually predict the wave heights from individual tsunamis that are based on the magnitude of the um, type of event or the magnitude of slippage uh, in rock sediment and things that create the tsunami. So, uh, and the at the time of the event, I seem to remember there were very quickly um, examples on the internet uh, of uh, how the wave would have propagated. So those types of calculations gave for that event that um, it was going to be a 15 meter wave height. It was a 9.1 uh, moment earthquake, which is near the top of things. I think there have only been two or three that have been larger than that. Um, in recent history, uh, I can't say about uh, the past. Um, you probably know more about the uh, Krakatoa event and the tsunami that was uh, produced in 1886, I think it was, than I do. Um, but modeling does give you predictions that are outside the range of the control that they actually had there. Um, they actually only needed to raise the uh, the wall around the plant by another six or seven meters, and they would have actually been safe, and you wouldn't have had the nuclear disaster you had on top of all the death and everything else. So it was foreseeable. It's an example, a bit like. Um, the Hurricane Katrina, where the technology has changed and allows you to do much better uh, assessment of the problem. But the problem why, uh, from what I've read of that disaster, was that you had two different organisations uh, looking at the safety and they weren't properly communicating. So uh, it politically fell in the cracks between these Two organizations. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. All right. Uh, before we move to another uh, attendee questions, uh, I, I think I missed a question from Ibu Mila. So I'll read out, uh, Tony, uh, from yeah. Ibu Mila. Uh, from your presentation, there are so many factors need to be considered in risk assessment process. However, in practice, many companies simplify the process by adopting a risk assessment matrix uh, that plot hazard level and consequences. What is your opinion about this? Uh, is there anything uh, that we can do to make risk matrix give us more accurate risk data? So please um, answer that, Tony. The... Um Risk matrix comes about because uh, you're uh, just doing a perception of risk uh, effectively uh, between either an individual or a group of people. And you always end up with the same problem, that low uh, probability events uh, that produce a very high impact are usually not judged high. They're judged low, and uh, that goes against um, basically a proper risk assessment. So it's better if you if you can to actually look at the mechanisms. Um, just trying to think. Perhaps it didn't come up. Perhaps it. I'll see if I can find the slide. It was that. Yeah, I don't remember seeing the slide. I probably missed it out. But in analysing risk, you, you've basically got areas where you've got good data, uh, but there's increasing uncertainty in the data. 
and you have foreseen incredible mechanisms for failure. And then you then have... So fantasy, there are no credible mechanisms by which that type of act can, can occur. But you then have the effect of technology change can actually make some of those fantasies actually become true. So they become seen credible mechanisms for now, when you start looking at the likelihood, you've got an expected outcome. And this then tends to gradually increase, but you have this tail risk uh, where there is no mitigation. Your risk exposure, which is a cost basically per annum of doing something about it, goes through uh, an expected, and then you have unexpected and expected. And so far as reasonably practical on that, on that consequences scale. But you're still left with catastrophic events that can occur, and there's absolutely no mitigation of the risk. So you've got to look in terms of those types of uh, processes um, of where you actually think your uh, risk is. And the other of doing that is to actually look at the credible mechanisms um, that can produce a, a top event. And it's why I said, have you analysed your systems with no control? They've been built and designed. Um, there will be in there some control, but it's probably not enough to um, stop escalation. So how does that um, actually work and it actually requires a lot more detail uh, than uh, most companies put into this does that answer your question Fabian? Uh, yes uh, Tony thank you very much uh, that's uh, the question from Ibu Mila Tejamaya uh, yes. she yeah. graduated from Adelaide University and also from uh, Birmingham University our colleagues from Occupational Health and Safety Department. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, uh, Tony, for your answer. And now I move to the, uh, some attendees uh, have already raised hands. I guess they would like to uh, ask the questions uh, directly. Is that okay, Tony? Yeah. Um, yep. How are we doing for time? Because I've actually got to get into Sydney after four o'clock. So. Uh... Oh, okay. What, what time uh, are you available? Uh, it, I'm today? okay for another quarter of an hour, 20 minutes. So I can answer 20 some minutes. Of these. Oh, all yeah. right. Thank you. I was just about to ask you. Okay. Uh, we have here Papa Alvin Alfiansha. Uh, maybe, Mas Adin, uh, you can open. For Papa I've Alvin got, to I've speak. I've got the question and answer thing open. Um, yeah. Good morning. Asking me. Good morning. Yeah. yeah good morning, me, Dr. Tony. Uh, my name is Alvin. Uh, now I am working in uh, Qatar, actually, in one of the biggest LNG company. Uh, I just want to have a question. Uh, do you uh, uh, do you have any suggestion? Because uh, recently in Indonesia we are richer in terms of rules and regulations uh, for the major hazard. For example, uh, we have like regulation of how to identify the hazard since 1999. And in 2004, we have a big disaster. It is a chemical industry. And the government also released one uh, letter how to deal with the major hazard. Unfortunately, up until now, we didn't have any regulations regarding how to calculate the risk. It means how to uh, estimate the ALAP regime. It means as low as uh, reasonable uh, practicable risk or how to accept the risk itself. So in non-commonwealth in this uh, country, yes, maybe they will not adopt any HSUK standards like uh, CHOMA, uh, Control of Major Hazard Regulations. And there was a, a triangle how to deal and to estimate the acceptable risk or alarm risk. So do you have any suggestion to, to us, uh, to Indonesian population, how to deal and how to estimate and accept the risk, especially 
uh, to accept any alarm. Uh, that's all, uh, Dr. Tony. I hope you, you can I, understand. I, I understand. I, I understand what you're asking. I'm not sure that I, I can answer uh, <laughs> that uh, specifically, um, but a route might be to have a look at. Um, the risk management standard, the international one, and see how they would suggest approaching it, um, and what, and how you use more one method for setting risk. Now, I don't know what risk you actually are looking at, uh, so it's difficult for me to comment, but. Usually, fine with measures. It's a combination of modelling as well as uh, assessment using other techniques, and coming up with uh, what you think is an answer, and then testing that answer against what's happened internationally. Um, And once you've done that and you've and you've got a test that seems to stack up with the way the international community looks at this, uh, then you've probably got the basis for a report and actually improving your own uh, safety. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, yes, uh, I guess because uh, this is the time limited. Uh, I will allow one more question from the raised hand. Uh, Muhammad Miftahul Huda. Are you able to talk? Okay. Hmm, okay. Maybe uh, he's not available to talk. Uh, I will move to Ibu. Noni. Or Ibu Haruki. Ibu Haruki, uh, please. Since Ibu Noni not uh, available, Ibu Haruki, please uh, have your questions directly to Dr. Tony Green. Ibu Aruki, are you available to provide your question directly? I think there is no response, Prof. No response, yeah, for both, from both. Okay, now I move to the question and answer. Uh, do you able to read uh, to the Q&A, Tony, or do, do you want us to show the PowerPoint again? I, I, I've got the Q&A session out. I just need to know. Who All right. uh, or which question I'm dealing with? <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe you can uh, uh, see the PowerPoint that uh, Abdul Qadir shared. This yes. is extracted yeah, from the Q and A questions. All right. Mufatma maybe only for one question because we need to time of Tony and things. Yes, yeah. right, yeah. Maybe uh, can so I take the first question. question there, which is from Dear uh, Kul Samawati. Um, I think... I need to go into quite a lot of detail. It's not necessarily all the engineering detail, uh, but it's also identifying what are the main factors that are going to affect your, your risks. Quantifying risks, if you can do it and have enough data, is obviously better than risks identified quantitatively or qualitatively, should I say. Uh, it also has the advantage that once you've got that data, you can put measurement systems in place to get more data that allows you to have some assurance about whether you're controlling those factors that are important. Uh, qualitative methods are actually very good for fleshing out what are likely to be the problem areas in the first, first place. 
but you do need then to go and try and measure that to see whether they're someone's perception or a group's perception or whether they are reality. So you actually do need quite to spend uh, quite a lot of detailed work uh, on that. Okay, I think that answers that question. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tony Green. I think our station uh, already up, uh, and I would like to thank you again for uh, excellent and very comprehensive uh, presentation today. And we've got a very much uh, insight uh, regarding major hazard and risk management. I think I would like to uh, hand over the session to our Master of Ceremony, Mba Miranda. Thank you. Professor Fatma. So this is the end of the international guest lecture of today event. So thank you again. We would like to thank you our speaker of the day, Dr. Tony Green, and also our moderator, Professor Fatma Lestari, as well as thank you to all parties that contributed to today's event. We also thank you for your participation in this international guest lecture. We apologize for any inconvenience in today's event. And as a reminder, all participants are expected to fill in the attendance on the link that we have sent through the chat column. And the A certificate will be sent to each participant in accordance with the data during registration. Thus, it concludes Today, the event of today that organized by OHS Master Program, Faculty of Public Health, Universitas Indonesia, and also supported by Alumni Association and the OHS Student Association. Thank you again. I close this event. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you, Tony, for your time. Highly appreciate your uh, presentation. Thank, thank you. you. And um, if you want to compile a list of the questions that are there and send them to me. I'll try and answer them for you. Okay. I have recap it and I will send to your email, Dr. Tony. Well, yeah. thank, you. thank you so much, Dr. Tony Green. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Tony. Have a great day in Sydney. I'll try to. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got Bye -bye. I've got an hour. I've got an hour. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Participants, about more than 1,000. <laughs>